Hello friend, today I am going to try to answer a very difficult question. That is, what is the best Bible translation for you? Now, I don't know if there are too many questions that are so loaded with emotion and history and differences of opinion. And I know I am treading on dangerous ground, but I do think if we can spend some time in looking at the different translations, I think it can help us with our walk with Jesus Christ. When we look at the English translations, we can look at over 900 different English translations of the Bible. That is a lot of translations. Over 100 of them are well published. You can go out and buy them online or in a bookstore. Why in the world do we have so many English translations of the Bible? It really comes down to just one significant thing, and that is time. There has been a lot of time since Coverdale, Tyndale first translated the Bible into English. They translated the very first copy around 1535, almost 500 years ago. A lot has happened in those 500 years. Everything from new archaeological discoveries, finding of new manuscripts, but also a significant thing has happened, and that is language has changed. In those 500 years, we have went from a Shakespearean, archaic, old English through time now into modern English. If you don't believe me, just travel over to Europe today and listen to the British version of English versus American English, or go pick up a, a unabridged Shakespearean book and read the English and, and look at the differences from then until now. Language has changed drastically. Also, they aren't just translating or trying to modernize something out of a language. They are having to translate out of ancient manuscripts. They are using ancient Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic to translate it into our language of today. And if you look at some of these languages, Hebrew, Aramaic especially, they are poor languages. It just means that there is not a lot of words in their vocabulary. English is a rich language. We have thousands and thousands of words. It's very, very, very precise. Hebrew is not that way. One word in Hebrew may get translated into 30 or 40 different English words. Things like the king reigns versus the king is ruling. Slight variation. English, we can do that with our words. Hebrew, it's a little bit harder um, in that language. But there's something else that these translators are having to work through, and that is, this isn't just any ancient manuscript. These are the very words of God. This is a sacred duty. I hope when you pick up your Bible, you realize that these words have been passed down from God to the autographed copiers, the first writers, and translated now into our own language. It is a sacred duty. When you look at what Coverdale was doing and Tyndale, they sacrificed everything. They went against the church. They went against the government, put their livelihood on the line. Tyndale paid the ultimate price. They burned him at the stake because he believed that the common man should be able to hold the very words of God in his hand, in his own tongue. Now, that creates a lot of different translations because it's now going through time, keeping up with the language from the ancient manuscripts. That's why we have so many translations. When I'm dealing with this question and try to help people grasp which translation is better or, or works for them, there's two significant questions that I want to ask. And the first one is, who is using the translation? Sounds basic, but there is a big difference between a young person, a child. If a child is reading it, they need an easy to understand, easy to comprehend translation versus if you have someone that is an adult or elderly, they may want even, for example, just large print. Not all translations have a large print Bible. The older I get, the more I... I enjoy a larger word than some of those small print Bibles. Also, when you're dealing with the older generation, a lot of times we have grown up with 
certain traditions that had a sanctioned translation. Even today, it is easier for me to read certain translations because that's what I grew up with. What about if it's someone that is low literacy? Someone that doesn't know the English language that well. You, there again, you want something that's easy to understand, or it's not their original language, it's their second language. There's different translations for that. Different types of ministries, they really come to play where, do you want a Bible that is easy to grasp the gospel message? If you understand who is doing it, then you can ask the second question, and that is, why? Why are you choosing that translation? And there's three key things that I, I, I want to focus on with why. One of it is, are you choosing it to read? If you are looking at a translation and wanting to use it as a, a book that you're going to read, you want the phrases to flow easily. You want it to be a little bit more poetic with it. That's different than if you are studying the text. If you're into word studies or studying the phrases or the structure, you want a translation that better translate from the manuscripts and shows you those patterns easier. The third one, most people don't talk about that much, but I think it's very important, and that is memorization. If you are memorizing the text, you want a Bible that the phrases flow together easily and make sense and easier to memorize. It, it's easier to tie sentence structures together. And I know for me, the, book, the translations that I use to memorize, I have about two, are different than the ones that I study out of. Yes, I use them as my base, but I do have different translations that I, that I dive into that are better structured for me to study out of than to, do, to read or memorize. Now, I want us to go through a lot of the top translations and look at the different categories that these translations fall under. So just bear with me as I flip my whiteboard over. Now you can see that there are three different ways that translators can translate the Bible. The literal equivalency or the literal translation is trying to take word for word out of the ancient manuscripts and match it to a modern day English word, but try to stay as close as possible to what the ancient manuscripts say. Clear on the other side of the spectrum, you have dynamic equivalency. That is paraphrasing. It takes the original sentence out of the manuscripts and then translate it into a modern paraphrased version, trying to match it better to how we can understand modern English versus how the ancient manuscripts may have tried to translate or transfer that thought when they were writing it down directly from God. Now, uh, one of the first ones is the Message Bible. In the early 2000s, Eugene Peterson was teaching a Sunday school class on Galatians. And one morning he looked up and realized his students were not connecting with the text. So he set out and single-handedly made a translation into common English, a paraphrased version, trying to keep the idioms and kind of try to keep the phrases, but make it into modern English as possible. Because he was a well-published author, his translation was well-sold and become a, a pretty famously sold Bible and is still accessible today. On the bottom of each of these cards or these book backs, you will see a number. And that number is the reading grade level of each of these translations. Another one is the Living Bible. Something similar happened to Kenneth Taylor in the 70s. He realized that people were not understanding it as well. And he himself also took the American Standard and translated it into the Living Bible. What's interesting about this one, this one became one of the best-selling books for kids. A lot of the picture Bibles that we had when I was growing up were often the Living Bible translation. It was the best-selling Bible in the 1970s. Another one is the easy-to-read version. In the late 80s, they created a version that was specifically for deaf people and people that had really struggled with the English language. And this was also one of the main ones that is used in things like prison ministries or outreach to low liter literacy groups that are struggling to understand English. And it sounds like I'm struggling with it a little bit myself. But this is a great Bible for those that have little to no background 
in reading the Bible. Another one that kind of fits in between the dynamic and heading toward sort of the combination is the Good News Translation. And the Good News Translation was trying to take this gospel message and put it into modern day English as well, but keep a very low reading level. And that is a reading level of six. The other one is the Common English Bible. Very similar. They were trying to create an easy, readable text um, and trying to make it accessible to as broad a range of people as possible. And their goal was to create an English version that would be able to be read by half of all English speakers. And then we have the contemporary English version. In mid the mid-1900s, they had three principles that they tried to, to, to nail down to dictate how they're going to translate the Bible. I find this very interesting because the first one, they were saying that they wanted to create a, a, a version that people speaking the text or reading the text wouldn't stumble over. It's a, it's a great thing to start out doing because the Bible sometimes is very hard to pronounce some of those words. They also wanted to make it so that people who had little to, to no understanding of the Bible could read it as well and com comprehend it. And the third one I really loved, they said that they, they wanted to create a Bible version that would be understood by all. That is very lofty goals. And that is the contemporary English version with a reading level of five. We are now moving more into the thought for thought translation pattern, but the first one is the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation was looking back at the Living Bible and trying to incorporate some of the ancient manuscripts and make it a little bit more thought for thought, still keep the dynamic equivalency, but make it more into the, the structure of a thought for thought pattern and include these original manuscripts. Then we have the Revised English Bible. In the 1960s, there was a lot of discoveries that were occurring. They were able now to, to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. A lot of the archaeological discoveries were coming to light. And they were trying to bring the English Bible forward. And this does have a solid uh, British flavor to it. This is the sanctioned Bible for the Episcopal Church, the Church of England, and also the Anglican Church of Canada. It also dealt with some of the gender language in the text that tried to be a little bit more gender neutral. So when you're reading the Psalms, it'll say, uh, instead of saying, blessed is the man who walketh not, or it'll say, um, happy is the one. So it tries to take out some of that where it was very specific, where it said man versus male and female, and do a little bit more gender neutral language. And then we have the Net Bible, one of my favorites. Um, in the early 2000s, they set out to create a digital version of the English Bible that's free for all, that anybody can access it, download it, and read it. But what's very interesting about the Net Bible, it includes over 60,000 translator notes. And in those, you can read why they chose that word, why they translated that way. And it's a great study Bible. Now it's in print. You can buy it. And it's a great one to have in your library. The next two are very specific. And these are... Two that the Catholic Church uses a lot. The first one is a New Jerusalem Bible written in 1985. And this also will include the Apocrypha. And the other one is the New American Bible. And this one is used by the Latin portion of the Catholic Church. And it's also um, used in the Episcopal Church. We also now get to three very famous translations of the Bible. And the first one is the NIV. And at the turn of the 1900s, scholars began to realize that the, some of the old translations, the King James and et cetera, were getting difficult to read in modern English. So they set to create a new international version of the Bible. Over 100 scholars came together. Um, and then in 1955, it really comes to be. The main one that we look at now is the 1986 um, or 84 version of the, of the text. In the early 2000s, they tried to update it again and be a little bit more gender inclusive in some of the language. It was a little bit of a kickback. It kind of reverted back more to that 1984 version. But the NIV tried to keep with the golden standard of the King James version, but also make it a little bit more thought for thought translation. The King James is kind of the gold standard of all translations. This one first began in 1604. That is an old translation. There was about 54 scholars that came together to try to translate the Bible um, 
and make it a little bit more um, accurate just because some of the earlier English translations didn't have some of the manuscripts. And they created a beautiful translation um, that reads difficult today, but some of it is still the gold standard of how all translations are kind of measured. And then in about 1983, they decided to update the King James to try to bring some of the language forward and created the new King James Version. We then come to the Revised Standard Version. This one has a decently long history as well. This began in the early 1900s. They were trying to take what the King James had done, but bring it into a modern day structure in modern day English. And they took it out of the American Standard Version into the first Revised Standard in 1952. And then in 1982 or 89, they get the new Revised Standard and this leads to the English Standard Version in 2001. This one's derived out of the Revised Standard Version, but they are trying to keep the theological framework that we're so used to, the words like justification, salvation, sanctification, all of those words in it, but use modern English to better understand it. And then we also have the New Revised Version. The New Revised Version in the late 80s, is trying to incorporate the text out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, those old manuscripts, and preserve the beauty of the King James as well, but bring that into a better readability with it. This version is the one you will typically find in universities. That's the kind of the, the gold standard now of what scholars are using. And now we're kind of moving more into this word-for-word -word side of it. And one that I wanted to mention here is the, whole, uh, the Holman Christian Study Bible in the early 2000s. They were trying to create a modern English translation out of the ancient manuscripts, but they wanted to try not to be a literal equivalency or dynamic equivalency. They called it, we want to have the optimal equivalency. And they tried to reproduce this text into a modern day tongue and modern day language. That is a great resource as well. Kind of a rethinking of some of these ancient manuscripts and is a great one to have in your library. And now we get more to the literal word for word. If you're trying to study it or trying to look at the actual meanings out of the ancient manuscripts, these are ones that really do that well. One is the New American Standard Bible. It's considered to be the most literal translation that has been done in the 20th century. The other one is the Amplified Bible. It's a little different take on it. They are trying to use phrases and synonyms to better tell the stories that are in the text. So um, verses like, I am the resurrection and the life, um, they will add in synonyms and descriptions to those phrases to give you better understanding. So I'm the resurrection life, whoever follows me, comes after me, they'll put in the paraphrase, give you all these different words to better explain it. And clear on this end is interlinear Bibles. And an interlinear Bible is literally the ancient manuscripts, Hebrew, Greek, um, and on it, it'll have a translation of the direct word underneath it. It'll tie a number to it that ties into Strong's concordances, but it also will have that English translation on the side. It'll have another English translation, so you can look at it. You can see the, the original word and how it's being translated, and it's a great one to it. Now, personally, I'm going to give you a few of my thoughts on what I love to use and why I do that. One of the ones that I really enjoy using is the Net Bible. It's a great resource because it has so many translator notes in it, those 60,900, I think it's 83 translator notes. It really helps in studying. So I do a lot of studying in the Bible, so I use the Net Bible. I will bring the NIV into it. Usually one of these. English Standard Reverse or the New Revised Standard, just because that's kind of the new one. And it's great then to see how these major works were translated. A lot of uh, people put the time and effort into these to try to translate it. When you start reading different translations, you'll realize that, okay, that one's different. Why is that different? That helps you to see it. And then I'll use the English, uh, the interlinear as well then to, to, to study it. That's if I'm studying the Bible. If I'm memorizing, this is just me personally, I'll use the NIV. I grew up with the King James. So that one is easiest for me to memorize because I have so much already in my head to memorize. 
if I'm looking at ministry or dealing with unchurched groups, I'm usually in this territory over here, um, just because of how it makes it easier for people to understand. Now, I am sure you have a ton of questions, and I know I didn't come close to covering all the translations. If you have questions, please jump in the comments. I would love to hear it. If you think I said something that you disagree with, I'd love to hear that too, because this, I think, needs to be talked about more and why there are certain translations and how it can help us in our walk with Jesus Christ.